Okay, so um, today I want to talk about who the Virgin Anasazi were, uh, mostly with an eye of how they would have viewed themselves, not how, how us archaeologists would have viewed them. When archaeologists use the word Anasazi, see I'm already using my hands, when archaeologists use the word Anasazi, we're putting a word to what we see in the archaeological record. So there's certain types of artifacts that we say mean Anasazi. But what did the people themselves think of it? Um, so that's kind of what I want to go through and talk about today. And you'll notice I have the word Anasazi in scare quotes. And I, I do that because, <coughs> excuse me, I do that because the term Anasazi is not preferred by their likely descendants themselves. Uh, that was actually a word that meant ancient enemy, uh, was told to the early colonists here, uh, given to them by the Navajo. So it's not a term they like. We usually call them ancestral Puebloan. The problem in the Virgin region is we don't know, as I'll talk, talk to you today, whether they really were ancestor to the modern day Puebloans, but they definitely were members of what we recognize archaeologically as the Puebloan culture. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Oops. Why are we not... Uh, nope. There we go. Okay. Have to learn how to advance it. All right. So, um, so what is it that we mean when we say ancestral Puebloan or Puebloan or Anasazi? Well, for archaeologists, we, we mean something very specific. We mean that they are a group of people who made pottery, this plain grayware that you see here, and the black and white pottery. They were farmers. They grew corn, beans, and squash, with most of the emphasis on corn, as do the historic Puebloan people. And at contact, and in the late prehistoric period, they lived in these above-ground, contiguous room, apartment-style complexes. Uh, before that, earlier in uh, ancient prehistory, they lived in these semi-subterranean pit houses. So this is what we mean by it. Now at contact, uh, there were still Puebloan people living very much like that, living in these type houses, making this type of pottery, growing corn. And there's still some Puebloan people, well, they all still, still very heavily uh, focused on corn. And a lot of them still live in some of these apartment style complexes. So we had that continuity from the archaeological record um, until today. Having a little trouble. Whoops, there we go. That'll that'll advance it. I think I figured it out. Okay, great. So to talk about who the Virgin Branch Pueblo and people then were, let's sort of look at what was going on around them. So these are the ancestral Pueblo and people, ancestors we believe to the modern day Pueblo, like the Hopi and the Zuni and, and, and the tribes along the Rio Grande. Um, around them, we have the whole Com to the south, Magillon, these were other farming communities. And then right over here, we have the Virgin Branch. You'll notice the Virgin Branch, you'll notice Southern Nevada is left entirely off this map. It's also left, at least this one gets Virgin, they call them Virgin Cayenta, but they leave them off of Southern Nevada. Um, so I, I show you this to show you that the Virgin Branch has really been largely overlooked. I think it's probably simply because Southwestern archaeologists who are interested in studying uh, these farming communities, they tend not to go north of the uh, Grand Canyon. They don't come over this far to the north and the west. Uh, and the Great Basin people tend to not come this far south. So they've been sort of overlooked, particularly uh, in comparison to all the other Puebloan groups, you know, like Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde, things, you know, the average member of the public is, is familiar with. Um, so they are way over here on the Western edge of the Puebloan world. These are other branches of the Pueblo culture. And today I'm going to be focusing specifically within the Virgin Branch area with the furthest West, those in the Moapa Valley of Southern Nevada. Okay, um, so when we look at them, again, this is just another way to look at it. Here's our, our Moapa Valley within the Virgin region. Their nearest neighbors, nearest Puebloan neighbors would have been the Cayenta group to the further east. Um, very similar in a lot of ways to the Virgin Branch, but a little bit different. Other Puebloan groups. Um, to the west and the north, we had all the Great Basin tribes, both in pre-European contact times, as well as after European contact, the Great Basin 
was occupied by people who didn't farm, didn't live in one place year round, um, but they were they were these very nomadic people who had to move across the Great Basin in order to get a you know to feed themselves because it just wasn't that much of an environment. And then you know to the south and the east you have those south southwestern tribes, the the Puebloan up here in the north uh, that, that they are believed to be very closely culturally related to. Um, I guess a couple more things. If we look at our Colorado River that comes up, that would have been a natural corridor down here to the Tucson Basin, uh, Southern Arizona, Phoenix Basin, Tucson Basin, where the whole calm were also a very arid, dry area, like the Moapa Valley, um, but they also were farmers and agriculturalists. So this is a picture of what the Moapa Valley looks like today. This is the Moapa Valley itself. Um, if you've ever been down there, the Muddy River flows through there. It's a very reliable river. It, 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 it uh, makes a very lush green landscape right on the river and on the floodplain. Today, that lush green that we're seeing here is uh, tamarisk, which if anybody is an invasive species, it wasn't here a uh, native in, in indigenous times, and it's, it's just nasty. I, I hate tamarisk. If you ever tried to hike through tamarisk, um, it's, it's the worst thing ever invented. Uh, but, but with a little imagination, you can imagine in prehistory times, that might have been cotton fields or corn fields. You can see how green it is. Now, the moment you get up off the river, this is what you encounter, this arid, arid, arid desert landscape. So you've kind of got this distinction between a super green, um, super green and lush floodplain and super dry and arid landscape adjacent to the floodplain. All right, what do we know about the Moapa Valley and its archeology. span Most of what we know come from these early excavations that were carried out uh, in the early 20th century between 1924 and 1941. These were very large scale excavations. They resulted in the excavation of hundreds of sites. In fact, um, they, they tried pretty much to excavate everything they found. So there's not a whole lot left in the Moapa Valley that's been unexcavated. Um, and at the time, nobody thought that you would have Puebloan peoples this far to the west. Uh, however, Mark Harrington, who oversaw these excavations, found abundant evidence that these were Puebloan. They look like other Puebloan cultures. Again, what do I mean when I say Puebloan? I mean, they grew corn. They were agriculturalists. He got a lot of charred corn. They made this black on white pottery and used it. They lived in this, uh, these are, this is from his excavations, of course, so they, they lived in these contiguous roomed uh, apartment style buildings, right? And before they did that, if you go back far enough, they lived in these partially underground houses, exactly what all the other Puebloan groups um, were doing further to the west. So at that point, he had evidence that there was a Puebloan culture this far west, although it was not well received at the time. And some people, uh, you know, without looking at what he found, just really argued against it. They did not think Puebloan people were this far west. Okay, so with that in the background, I wanna kind of get into who are the Virgin and Asazi? But before that, we wanna go back in time and know what was going on before the Virgin Branch people were here, the culture that we recognize as Virgin Branch. Doesn't mean anything about who they were ethnically or linguistically. We can't tell that archeologically. We can just tell what their artifacts look like. Um, so Puebloan people emerged in the North American Southwest at roughly around the time of Christ or a few hundred years after the time of Christ. Uh, everywhere. They weren't here before that. So what came before the Puebloan people in the Moapa Valley? Well, the earliest evidence of humans in the area comes from that, the Paleo-Indian or what we call the Paleolithic period. Uh, and this, the Moapa Valley, Remember, it was right between these two different cultural zones. To the west and to the north, we have the Great Basin groups. To the east and to the south, we have all of these agriculturalists, and especially the other Puebloans if you're up north. Uh, we see that division going way back as far as the Paleo-Indian period. Now, this is the end of the Ice Age. We have these big megafauna. Uh, which we'll be talking about, I guess, when we, in, in the, the next talk about, about Tule Springs, um, where we do have evidence of megafauna. So we're right between here. So to the, what, to the east, 
we find when we do find paleo Indian remains, um, we find these fluted projectile points that are associated with the very well-known Clovis point, and we seem to find sites that are largely focused on big game hunting. Whoops, I'm sorry. To the west, out in California, however, you get a different type of contemporaneous Paleo-Indian or what they even call Paleolithic culture. Uh, you don't tend to get these fluted points. You get some, but they look a little different, actually. Mostly what you get there are these these contracting stems, see how contracting because the base is narrow and thin at the top, these contracting stem projectile points. Mm -hmm. And instead of a focus on big game hunting, they seem to be much more focused on uh, pluvial lakes. So they're doing things like, you know, hunting the, the, uh, the water birds that come to the lake and catching the animals that come to the lake and eating the, the plant resources that are around the lake. And there's other differences between them too, um, between the technology and between the lithic assemblages that I won't get into. My point is there's really two different cultures. Now in the Moapa Valley itself, we don't have much evidence of the Paleo-Indian period, uh, which isn't very surprising. Anybody who run through the area, there weren't a whole lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we know they were kind of here, uh, but, but, but there's just so little we can't really, we don't really have sites. We have the isolated points. Okay, so but the next point during the archaic period, we do have more, um, more archaeological sites and we can begin to tell a little bit more. So what we have during the archaic period, I, I didn't give you times, so I'm sorry, this was the end of the uh, Pleistocene, the archaic period, depending on, you know, when you want to end the Paleolithic, let's just say six to 8,000 BC to the time of Christ, we'll go with that, um, give or take, right? take. So we do have evidence, good evidence for the archaic period occupations of this area. Um, and what we seem to see here is they're reflective of these, they're, they're still hunting and gathering, they're highly mobile, they're, you know, traveling around to catch their food. Um, we have good evidence from Chuckwalla Cave down, uh, down in the Moapa Valley, uh, archaic period rock art, and then we have these projectile points. And all of this material culture looks very similar from really California to the Eastern Great Basin, okay? I'm sure if somebody does a good study, they're gonna pick up some differences, but there haven't really been a lot of studies, but in general, it's very similar culturally. And these projectile points are found throughout that area. And especially look at this projectile point. This is what we call a gypsum point, okay? Um, and this point is, is ubiquitous on archaic sites, uh, really, as I said, from that whole area to the east side of the Great Basin all the way over to California. California. And then this comes from um, Heidi Roberts, wrote a wonderful historic context document. This is something that my colleague Barb Roth put together. Uh, during the period, these are the number of sites, and this is where we're interested in, right here, the Moapa Valley, okay, right where Logan Dell and Overton are today, for those of you who might not might be familiar with that. So what we see are sites uh, beginning to fill in, population slowly growing. You can see they're really clustered along the rivers. And um, by the late archaic, this landscape is beginning to get a little more filled up. And as it fills up, you have the, uh, the people, they're still hunting and gathering, and no farming at this time, but they're beginning to stay in one place longer and longer, okay? They're beginning to, you know, probably partly because the landscape's filling up, and so they now they're spending maybe several months in one place and then seasonally moving. Okay, so what's going on? Up until the archaic period, they seem to be this generalized Western United States type of culture, okay? It's not a whole lot of a distinction from one end to the other. And then sometime around the time of Christ, give or take, maybe 500 AD, you start seeing farming come in. And you see when farming comes in, you get a really rapid, quick changeover in uh, the material culture, okay? All of a sudden you get pottery, you get fully sedentary houses, more, more labor, more time put into building your houses. You start cradle boarding your infants. You start um, having storage technology. You just see a major disjuncture in the archeological record. So, and we see that not only here in the Moapa Valley, we see it everywhere around the, the Southwest, right? So up on the Colorado Plateau, where they're nearest Puebloan neighbors, the Cayenta, 
Pueblo would have lived. You see the same thing. You had hunters and gatherers, suddenly you have farming. And when you get this farming, you get a changeover in material culture. I'm obviously simplifying that. I, I can almost imagine a couple of people wanting to argue with me and I'll talk about that more, but that was the old thought. It used to be pretty simple. Hunters and gatherers, in, in come some immigrants, from Southern Arizona, it was thought, they moved up to the Colorado Plateau. They brought with them corn seeds and farming and, and all sorts of different uh, types of material culture. And then the thought was, then once they were up there, they popped down to the Moapa Valley, displaced all those hunter gatherers, settled down and brought farming into the area. So that was the old thought. Um, we now know the scenario is much more complicated, even on the Colorado Plateau. I'm not going to be talking about that. The Moapa Valley is enough to talk about. Um, but even on the, the Colorado Plateau, we now know that it it's, it's much more of a confusing picture. Some corn seems to come in before the material culture changes. Uh, maybe it wasn't hunters and gatherers who, who were adopting farming. It's much more complicated, even up on the Colorado Plateau. Um, so our models have to be revised. Was it immigrants who brought in farming? In some cases, it definitely seems to be so. In some cases, though, it seems like maybe locals and hunters and gatherers adopted it. So it's getting messier everywhere. Um, I always tell my students, it's real easy to tell a nice, easy story when you don't have much data because the dots connect really well, right? You've got two dots, you have a straight line. It's once you start getting three and four and five dots that things get messy, right? So it's getting a little more complicated. But what are the implications of this then um, from the Moapa Valley? Oh, okay. Well, so I, I, actually, let me go back. I'm sorry. So this shift from the archaic period when they were hunters and gatherers to the very first farming is called the shift from the archaic period to the basket maker period. At least it used to be thought to the basket maker period. What do archaeologists mean when we say basket maker period? Again, we're describing what we find uh, in terms of material culture. Um, so what do we mean? We mean they were farming, but they didn't yet have pottery. Okay, that's by definition. And, and um, it's a little more, there are some diagnostic artifacts that are believed to indicate the presence of basket maker two people. So for example, those gypsum points that we just showed you with the contract, contracting stem on the Colorado Plateau, they disappear with, at basket maker sites. Gypsum points are gone. Instead, you get this new type of side notched Western basket maker point. So that's one reason they thought it was a population replacement because there's just no continuity. Gypsum points out, Western basket makers in. Um, but there's a few other things. They get these S-shaped rabbit sticks uh, that, that are thought to, to be used for, for rabbit hunting. They get these distinctive type of uh, sandals, square fringe toed. They get these twine, hemp, or opossum baskets that, that weren't there in the archaic period. None of this was here in the archaic period, right? And they get something called two rod and bundle basketry. Now, two rod and bundle basketry is a very specific way of making baskets, okay? And that did not exist in the archaic period at all. Doesn't show up on the Colorado Plateau until farming arrives. Now it stays throughout the Puebloan sequence. So it's not a diagnostic of only basket maker, but the thought is when you get to rod and bundle basketry in, in, on sites that have no pottery, then they're basket maker two sites, all right? So they are, um, so they're thought to be diagnostic in that sense, right? Um, and then there's a whole lot of other things we also see with the basket maker two period that aren't necessarily temporarily diagnostic that can be found in other time periods of other sites, but they're things like nets and slab line cysts and, and other things like that. So um, if I was live, we could make this a little more interactive, but, but since I'm talking to a computer screen, we'll do this. One thing some of you may have noticed, let's look at this. These are the diagnostics. This is how we recognize basket maker sites. There's a problem if you're sharp, right? Almost all of these things, except for the projectile points, are perishable. Things like rabbit sticks and fringe-toed sandals, they are not going to preserve well unless it's a cave site. So not surprisingly, most of what we know about Basket Maker 2 comes from cave sites. Nonetheless, when people have found corn at sites that lack ceramics, they have thought they them to be basket maker too. 
okay? With the idea they probably had all these other things, but they just rotted away and didn't preserve. So it can be a little difficult to recognize Baskin-Baker II sites. All right, so let's talk about early uh, Basket Maker II sites in the Boapa Valley. So for the longest time, the westernmost site that was generally accepted as Basket Maker II, and I bet if you went out and asked a lot of Southwestern archeologists, they might still say this. We've got to, got to get, them, get, them, get them caught up here, um, was, was um, Cave DuPont here near Canaan, all right? However, when Harrington did his work in the early 1900s, he was digging in the Moapa Valley along the floodplain. These are not cave sites, but he found four sites that had horn, but they did not have ceramics. And he suggested that they were basket maker two sites and that basket makers from the Colorado Plateau, from up here, came down during the basket maker period and, and, and settled here. Wasn't well received, right? He didn't have a whole lot of data. He just had, had corn, but no, um, no pottery. However, there's another site that is a cave site and we have a lot more evidence and that's Black Dog Cave. Okay, so let's talk about Black Dog Cave. Black Dog Cave has both the Basket Maker 2 component inside the cave and the subsequent period, Basket Maker 3 period, up on the adjacent mesa. Basket Maker 3, just like Basket Maker 2 more or less, but it has pottery, all right? So, um, Black Dog Cave is about 130 miles away from Cave DuPont. And this was really the first site that really kind of showed that there was definitely a basket maker component. The uh, Black Dog Cave was first discovered in the 1930s, but then they lost it. Nobody could ever relocate it again. Um, and then in 1942, uh, Bradley Stewart found it, his little black dog actually, they could never find that cave again. And the black dog ran into the cave. So it's called Black Dog Cave, it's his little Scottish terrier. Um, and they excavated it in 1942. Um, And in 2000 and 2001, the Harry Reid Center went out and conducted additional excavations there and they reanalyzed the materials that were found in the 1940s. And they found what they thought was very strong evidence of a basket maker two uh, settlement here. Why are we not advancing? There we go. All right, so what do we have at, Bas at, at Black Dog Cave? Well, the site consisted of a rock shelter, cyst, and a pit house village, all right? So these partially underground houses, the pit house villages. It was radiocarbon dated to 8090. So there was no question that this is contemporaneous with other known basket maker two sites, right? It's very, very, very early. And it's located on bluffs, which is very typical of basket maker two sites elsewhere. Why is this having? There we go. All right, so let's look at basket at Black Dog Cave and say, see why they thought it was a basket maker two site. Well, these are typical basket maker two style houses, slab lined as we talked about, underground storage cysts like this, where they would have stored their corn preservably. I'm having a little trouble for some, for some reason. Okay, here we go. Maybe I'll just. There we go. Well, we think. There we go. Okay. So, what else did they have? Well, they had S shaped fending sticks like this. They have basket maker style sandals, those square toed fringe sandals that are just always considered diagnostic of basket maker, too. They had. There we go. And they had what they consider the smoking gun. Now that two rod and bundle basketry is absolutely everywhere they find it. It does not exist on the Colorado Plateau prior to the earliest agriculture. When the earliest agriculture come in, comes in, you find this two rod and bundle basketry. So that's that population intrusion evidence. And they found two rod and bundle basketry. Uh, and then they had a lot of other similarities as well that I won't get into, the twine hip baskets and, and, and a few other things. So the excavators of Black Dog Cave said, yes, this is proof that the basket makers had migrated into the Moapa Valley and they brought with them agriculture. And eventually, the story goes, they settled down and over time developed into the Virgin Branch culture. Yeah, so here is, here is what they quote. One thing is certain, the basketry recovered at Black Dog Cave 
clearly suggests migration into Southern Nevada from the core area with continued community ties to the East. All right, so that's where, where I kind of came in. And 2000, so, so this story made sense. It sounded feasible to me. I agreed with it. I think most people probably did. Um, and in 2006, Steve Derone, who was then the archeologist at the Lake Mead National Recreation Area, asked us to go back and, and, and try to find everything associated with Lost City, to reanalyze any human remains found, uh, and to start up some additional excavations. So from here out, I'm gonna kind of talk about what we learned as a result of that project. And this, by the way, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's just an artist rendition of what the main site occupied by the Virgin Branch Pueblowans would have looked like. It's called Main Ridge. And you can see again, those are Puebloan houses, no doubt about it, right? All right, so what I mostly want to start off talking about is the, the results of the analysis of the human remains, specifically the teeth. So at that time, we had Dr. James Watson. He's now an archaeologist at the University of Arizona. And we asked him to go back and look at the teeth of all of the human skeletons that we had data for. We had 21 burials from at least 10 different sites. And he used a method that was developed by Christy Turner at Arizona State University to, to record the attributes found on the teeth. Now, the important thing about the attributes he, he looked at, they're not metric. There's nothing he measures. There's no destruction. It's just visual observation. Like, are the incisors shovel-shaped? Are the... Are the I'm so not a bioarchaeologist, so I can't get <laughs> can't really get into it. But but you know what do these teeth look like? Do they have traits? Are they present or absent? Okay, so it's really presence or absence mostly. And the nature of these traits are that they're free of sex and age bias. In other words, males or females, it doesn't matter what you ate growing up. It doesn't matter. Um, these are things that would generally be inherited. So they tell you something about their ancestor ancestry. Okay, and what he found was these, this virgin or the, or the Moapa Valley virgin branch people, he put them in. Now, luckily, Christy Turner has created a huge database of, of, of data for teeth from all throughout the Southwest. And if they, the people in the Moapa Valley descended from basket makers from the Colorado Plateau, if they, if they descended from people who immigrated here, from the Colorado Plateau, they should cluster very closely to this Western basket maker. They don't. In fact, they look different than every other Southwestern group. They should also be very close to the Cayenta, right? Cayenta are their closest cousins. Chaco Canyon. They don't even look like the Hocom. In fact, they look different from all the other Southwestern groups we compared them to. And um, this is just to give you an idea of how it looks. These are just some of the sites that he looked at. This is the lowland Moapa Valley, the Virgin Branch, Eastern Basket Makers, the early people over, uh, you know, on the Eastern Colorado Plateau, the Western Basket Makers. These are the people we thought moved down to the Moapa Valley. The Cayenta, these are the later Puebloans, Pocom from Southern Arizona, Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Benito. And as you can see, let's see, do I have that? Oh yeah. They're very different and sometimes amazingly so. So this is a mesial ridge on the canine. You can see that in all of the other cultures, it is not 100% present, but it's present on almost all of their teeth. It's completely missing in the Virgin Ranch area. Uh, same thing with the Udo has taken premolar. Almost all the teeth from other groups in the Southwest have this. None of the teeth in our sam Virgin Branch sample had. So they're looking pretty different. So I asked him, there we go, to create a dendrogram. And he plotted on, this is more than what you just saw. These are all these different databases from the Southwestern United States, who are the farming communities. They all kind of cluster together way out here by themselves are the lowland virgin branch people of the Moapa Valley. So I said, wow, I did not expect that. That suggests that the Moapa Valley people were not genetically related to other Southwestern groups and that Cayenta basket maker immigrants did not move into this area and, and, and uh, bring farming with them and settle and ultimately become Virgin Branch. So I asked him, I said, Jim, are there any other databases from anywhere in the Great Basin? And he said there was one. And that da database came from the Stillwater Marsh area of Northern Nevada. And as you can see, they're not super close to them, but they're a lot closer to them than they are to any of the Southwestern groups. 
So what does this mean? Well, I interpret this to mean that the lowland virgin branch people, nobody migrated in and displaced the hunters and gatherers. They were probably descendants of the local hunters and gatherers. They were descendants of this big, broad, Great Basin uh, genetic cultural group, right? That over time started to adopting farming and adopted the material culture of Puebloan people, but they were genetically, they came from a very different ancestry. Okay, so I think they're similar, not because they were super close, but they were just part of this, this very large uh, genetic group from the Great Basin. Okay, so now, why do we have all that basket maker stuff at Black Dog Cave if basket maker immigrants did not move in and settle in the valley? Well, let's look, take a closer look at, at, at Black Dog Cave, okay? It did have a lot of basket maker two materials. There is no doubt about it. Let's look a little closer. Let's look, for example, at the projectile points. Now, if you remember, we said that um, in the archaic period, we had this contracting stemmed gypsum-like point, remember, up on the Colorado Plateau. We have it everywhere. But when the Basket Maker 2 comes up in up on the Colorado Plateau, these points go away. We don't have them. It's a little more complicated. We're not going to get into all that. But for the most part, with you have, have basket maker displacements, you don't get those gypsum points. All right. Um, instead, you get these Western basket maker points. Black Dog Cave didn't have one Western basket maker point, no Western basket maker point. But what it did have, it continued to get have this gypsum like point, the same point that they'd had in the archaic period. OK, so they're they're. Um, Lithics look quite different. Now they do have elbow corner notched, which looks superficially like Western basket maker. You get these elbow corner notched up on the Colorado Plateau. They are different and they can be distinguished um, in, in the technology used to produce them and, and, and other things. Um, and then you get these black dog cave points, which look a lot like points you get out in the Great Basin. Okay, oh, Harrington had defined points like this out in Borax Lake in California. So their project point technology actually is not looking basket maker too. It's looking still very Great Basin. Just look again at those sandals. Here's the Puebloan style sandals. They definitely have those at Black Dog Cave, but they also have these other styles that are associated with the Great Basin. So they had 15 sandals. Of these, uh, eight were basket maker and five were Great Basin style. I think they couldn't, there's two more that they couldn't tell, right? Just too, too degraded. So they have both side by side, by blowing and the Great Basin style. Now let's look at that two rod and bundle basketry. That's considered the smoking gun of, of, of of a basket maker and proof that a population had had migrated into the area bringing this technology because it didn't exist in the archaic period up on the Colorado Plateau. Um, so we have two rod and bundle basketry and this is what two rod, I don't know how well you can see that, but basically what two rod and bundle basketry is you get two stiff rods like two sticks, bundle it with um, some type of grass or something and then weave over that. So that's, it's a very specific technology that if you're a textile specialist, you would be able to recognize. Um, well, that's how that was considered proof that somebody had moved from the Colorado Plateau down into the Moapa Valley. But a few years ago, they found a two rod and bundle basket from Firebrand Cave. Firebrand Cave is right here, okay? It's right between uh, sort of the Moapa Valley and the Colorado Plateau, but it's not on the Colorado Plateau. It's down in the desert. Right, I think it's down in that Gulf Butte area. Um, and then they radiocarbon dated it and it came back to 1890 to 1115 BC. So this basket is at least a thousand years to 1500 years earlier than any other two rod and bundle basketry known from the Colorado Plateau. Why is this important? Well, it suggests that, you know, people have always assumed that the two rod and bundle basketry uh, can, can, was developed, you know, developed down south, came up to the Colorado Plateau, and then was brought into the Moapa Valley by these immigrants who came up from the south. This, however, says hmm, maybe, maybe, maybe instead of assuming that the basket makers moved into the Moapa Valley, that Southern Nevada's desert area was part of that world that turned into the basket maker too. That they gave 
material cultural traits to the basket makers. They didn't, they weren't just these passive recipients, but they were interacting with them. And the idea of that came from, from the desert, not from the uplands. Okay, so what's my point? What on earth does all of this mean? Well, first of all, I'm going to argue that the emergence of the Puebloan culture in Southern Nevada was an indigenous development. Nobody moved in and displaced hunters and gatherers. Instead, it was the local hunters and gatherers who adopted farming. And when they adopted farming, they also adopted all sorts of other stuff that, that their nearest farming neighbors, the, you know, the people up on the Colorado Plateau had. They adopted you know, ceramics and storage technology and, and Puebloan style architecture. But it was a local development. And so I'm gonna argue that the Virgin Branch people really are probably not ancestor to the modern day Puebloans at all. Instead, they were great basin people who kind of shifted their, the way they, they made a living and shifted their material culture and shifted their identity. Okay, the maize was probably not brought in by immigrants from the Colorado Plateau. Where do I think it came from? I think it came from Southern, Nevada, Southern Arizona. Makes more sense anyhow. Up here, you don't have any rivers. They are farming, you know, you're up on the Colorado Plateau, six to 7,000 feet in elevation. It gets really cold. You have short growing seasons. You're having to grow. You can't irrigate up there. There's no rivers to irrigate. So you're having to, your corn is growing just if the rain falls, right? It's a whole different situation in the Walker Valley. For anybody who's stepped outside in Southern Nevada at all, you know, if you tried to grow a garden and you didn't water it, it's not going to grow very well. We get what, like two inches of rainfall a year. We're just not going to get enough rainfall to water across. They had to irrigate and they could irrigate very well on the Muddy River. It's very, uh, very good for irrigation. And they didn't have any, they didn't need crops that corn that matured really quickly. We do not have a, um, we do not have a frost problem here. We do not have a growing season problems. So you're not gonna get, have too short a growing season. So the corn seeds they had up here probably weren't even the best thing for the, the uh, uh, Moapa Valley and Muddy River, right? They probably, I argue, got the corn from the down in Southern Arizona where people were in the Sonoran Desert, much like, you know, very arid area, not a lot of rainfall, and they had to irrigate. So if you were going to pick up farming for the first time, it makes more sense to not only get the corn seeds, but also the knowledge of how to, to farm from Southern Nevada, where they were irrigating, because they, they'd have to tell you not only here's a seed, but here's how you do it. Here's how you grow the food. So those were the people who had the, the similar type of technology that we need to grow corn in the Moapa Valley, not not these people up here, right? So that's a little speculative, but I think it's a good speculative. Um, there's a few other lines of evidence uh, supporting that. Uh, first of all, we now know this that used to be that the earliest, you know, used to be that the Moapa Valley corn, hmm, you know, 300 AD, and the corn on the Colorado Plateau, maybe 200 AD. So, you know, we're a little bit later, that made sense. Now though, from the larder site uh, down in the wetlands of, of uh, of uh, the Las Vegas wash here in Las Vegas Valley, Heidi Roberts and Rick Alstrom have found corn pollen in pits that were dated to about the time of Christ. So now our earliest corn, earliest evidence of farming comes down here on a major tributary from the Colorado River. So it makes much more sense that it probably came up through the Colorado River. I admit I'm still being speculative, but that's what I think. We also have uh, from Black Dog Cave, a spindle whirl used to weave uh, string into cloth that had still had cotton fibers attached. The only people at that time that we know of that were growing cotton were in Southern, Nevada, Southern Arizona, okay? So either they got the cotton traded from Southern Arizona or they may have even got cotton seeds. It could have been growing cotton. Cotton needs a lot of water, but you can do it because you can irrigate here. And we also have some Ho'okam projector points at Black Dog Cave. They're, they're very similar in style to the Ho'okam. So we know they had contact with, with Southern Arizona. And that's where I suspect the corn came from rather than the Colorado Plateau. Okay, so with that in mind then, who were the low, lowland virgin branch people? Well, I argue that they were descendants of local indigenous Great Basin archaic hunting and gathering people. Nobody came and displaced them. 
was, it was their own, it was the hunter-gatherers descendants who decided to start farming. By about AD 200, they acquired corn. I'm gonna argue from the South, we haven't got that proven yet. And then after they got corn in the following generations, very quickly, they began to align themselves more closely with the sedentary farming groups that lived to the East, the Cayenne basket makers, than they did with their foraging cousins to the West in the Great Basin, okay? They started adopting the material culture, which is really a way of assembling how you view yourself and how you want other people to view you, view you right? So, you know, people move to the United States, they often adopt uh, our, our style of clothing to fit in, right? Or our style of whatever. So it looks like they were trying to adopt the material culture of other Puebloan people. And the other thing I really wanna make a point, so often the Moapa Valley is just ignored. It's this far Western part of the Puebloan culture. It's just this watered down culture that made it here, but never developed very much. And they just kind of adopted whatever they were able to adopt. Well, that's not true. They weren't just a passive recipient of the basket maker culture. We have to look at the Moth Valley if we want to understand how the basket maker culture developed and emerged. They were part of its emergence, not just a passive recipient. They gave them the idea of this two rod and bundle basketry. So um, we're arguing that they renegotiated their identity, that they had been great basin hunters and gatherers. And you know, if you'd walked around at say 1000 BC, I would have argued if you were in the great basin, people would recognize each other. They, might, they had some differences. They might've even spoke different languages, but, but they would recognize themselves as part of a general culture. And the Puebloans, the basket makers, up on the Colorado Plateau recognized themselves as a different Puebloan group. But after these hunters and gatherers adopted agriculture, they began to grow more culturally like other uh, Puebloan farmers. Why did they do this? Well, I'm sorry, I've got this funny little part three, you can ignore that. They required the development of new technologies and knowledge, right? If you're gonna adopt farming, that's a major lifestyle change. You have to now farm, you have to live in one place to, to grow the food. And so if you're living in one place, now you have to, minimally, the next year you need some seeds to be able to plant. So you've got to have storage technology. You've got to have uh, new recipes. How on earth, do, how do I store this corn? How do I cook this corn? How do I prepare the corn? You need a whole new everything. And so once they adopted farming, I think it made more sense for them to start interacting with and aligning themselves with other Puebloan people. If nothing else, if, if something happened and they had to eat all their corn seed, they didn't have any you know, corn to, to plant the next year, they had to have people they can interact with to trade with to get more seed, right? They weren't gonna get it from the Great Basin people, they remained hunters and gatherers. So they really needed to uh, develop ties with other farmers. And the nearest farmers to them were the Puebloan people up on the Colorado Plateau. Um, and so I say that they, to me, I think they changed their identity to some degree because it would have facilitated participation in the Puebloan world, right? You know, you, you walking, there's no doubt at, uh, at even in the basket maker period, certainly throughout the Virgin Branch period, if somebody had come traipsing through the Moapa Valley at AD 1000, they would think of them as Puebloan, okay? Might be a little different, just like uh, New Yorkers look a little different from us. But we recognize them, we're part of the same culture, right? Uh, whereas if you look at, I don't know, you know, we're just Afghanistan, right? Looks like a different culture, right? So it, looking alike, recognizing you as the same culture really facilitates that interaction. So I think that's why they renegotiated their identity. But I think it's really important to notice that they didn't adopt all aspects of the Puebloan life world. They seem to keep some aspects of their own ancestral Great Basin heritage. Okay, so everywhere throughout the Puebloan world, they started off living in these partially underground houses that we call pit houses. And then around the time of, you know, a thousand, give or take 200 years, they shifted out of those underground houses into these above ground rooms. And when they did this, we'll just focus right now on the Cayenne region, you see similar things elsewhere. You get a very standardized uh, settlement layout. 
So you get uh, the room block. These are above ground rooms, those apartment style contiguous houses, duplex style, but they're more than duplexes. There's what, six rooms here. In front of that, you keep one pit house, one underground house, which was to become the Kiva or the religious structure. We know this because at contact, they were still using this. They still use these today. Okay, so we're not just speculating. We, we know this. And then they associated with that, they all have uh, milling rooms. They have a room that always faces the Kiva and it has a picture of the milling rooms. Let's see. There we go. These are the milling rooms, right? Where women would sit and, in a row historically and grind corn. So they are very standardized uh, ways of, of living, very cookie cutter, you know, very, what do you want to say, uh, uh, you know, like a, a, a development that has, has model homes. They're all, all using the same layout and plan. That's in the Cayenne area and in other areas. It's also in the Mesa Verde area and, 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 and other areas of the Puebloan world, right? We don't get this in the Virgin Branch area. They never adopt this Kiva. They never adopt these milling rooms. So they have some things that they do very differently. So let's first talk about the Kivas. So Kivas are adopted by about 900 to 950 by most Puebloan people. These are these underground rooms. Once their underground houses moved above ground, they kept, they kept Kivas and that was it as their underground structures, okay? At contact, and today these are religious structures. Only the men are allowed in them and they perform ceremonies. And among the Hopi, those ceremonies are performed to bring rain, okay? Um, and we recognize them by very specific, not just that they're underground, they have things like a ventilator shaft and loom anchors that are weaving in them. They have foot drums. They have a very small hole usually uh, uh, put into the floor of it as the Sipapu, which is believed to be the entrance to the underworld. So they're very specific and we can identify them in the Cayenne area. There's been some hypothesized kivas in the Virgin Branch area, but there's really, there's never been one that's indisputably a kiva. And in the Moapa Valley, there are no known kivas whatsoever. So they never adopted it. They just didn't adopt it. Why not? I don't know. Um, in the Western, well, there's a couple, in the Western Puebloan world, the kivas even today are associated with the Kachina cult. The Kachina cult is used by the Hopi. It is to bring the rain. Because remember up on the Colorado Plateau, if it doesn't rain, you don't eat. That was the only way to water your crops. You cannot have irrigation canals on the Colorado Plateau because there's no rivers, okay? So it's a very important thing. Without the, kachin without the kivas, you won't have the kachinas, you won't bring the rain. Um, but let's just think about that. In the Moapa Valley, they didn't need to bring the rain because they were irrigating, right? So it may be that they just didn't buy into that whole religious ideology. I'm going to go out before somebody nails me on this. Yes, that's speculative. We don't know for sure that there was anything like the Kachina cult at 950 AD. We know it was there at contact. Um, Nonetheless, I suspect there was something precursor to the Kachina cult. I mean, there's evidence for precursor, maybe the crystallization of that belief. Uh, regardless, though, it's a very big difference. You have very strong gender role separations. The men in the Kivas, women not allowed in it. They don't have that in the Moaka Valley. Um, now, John Ware has suggested that Kivas are associated with a shift to matrilocality. He says, once your matrilocality being when you marry and you move in with the wife's family, right? And he says, well, that leaves all the men of one clan spread out. And so you had these kivas where they could get together and share knowledge. Um, I think his argument's compelling. So it may even be that they retain patrilocality, patrilocal, that they, they never shifted to this natural local uh, lifestyle of, of the Cayenne. But again, that, 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 that needs some additional uh, studies, but it could be studied. There's definite ways to try to pick that up. Great dissertation topic there for somebody. Lots of dissertation topics in the Virgin Branch area. They also, though, they never had those milling rooms, right? In the Cayenne area, they would mill at contact when the Europeans arrived, they reported that women, these are Hopi women milling in the, the, the milling rooms, would spend hours and hours and hours a day grinding. I mean, these women had super strong arm bones because they ground so much. Um, and they kind of combined themselves into all one room, I assume, so we'd get less boring and you could gossip and talk to one another. 
we don't have these milling rooms at all in the Moapa Valley. So again, this suggests to me the lack of the kivas and the lack of the milling rooms tells me something different going on with the Moapa Valley people. They did not get these super strict gender divisions of labor that we see in the other Pueblo groups. So that's one difference. They also differed in their hunting practices, right? So um, let's see, this is the lowland virgin, the red, the blue is all of the Southwest. So I've been a Southwestern archeologist for a long time. And um, when you're digging and you dig up animal bones, one of the, the jokes always people say, what animal is this? And you say, it's a rabbit. And why do you say it's a rabbit? Because 90% of the time you're gonna be correct. You don't have to know faunal remains at all, right? The point is small mammals and rabbits really dominate everywhere in the Southwest once people become farmers. Why? Well, the thought is now you're farming, can't travel as far to hunt because you've got to stay a little more tethered to your fields. But also you don't want all those little bunnies and rodents eating your corn. So you're staying in the field, you're, you're getting rid of those small mammals and you're killing them and you're eating them. And so that's what you see. All of the Southwest, you see that 68% of what they find are small mammals. Um, in the lowland virgin, you see the opposite. The most common type are the large mammals like bighorn sheep or deer. Um, why is that difference? Well, it's not explained by an environment. The Moapa Valley, there's not a lot of big game running around, right? You'd have to go all the way to the Virgin Mountains uh, or the Spring Mountains to get deer. We do have bighorn sheep at the Valley of Fire, so there would have been some bighorn sheep. But compared to the Colorado Plateau where you have all of the, the trees and the landscape, they have much higher density of big game up there. So it's not explained um, at all by the environment. Um, this is just another, and the ratio of very small animals to larger ones. Um, in the lowland virgin, you can see they hardly have any small game. In Cayenne, Little Colorado, these are other areas dominated by small, small game. I'm gonna watch my time because I know I always go long on this. Okay, I'm gonna be wrapping it up soon. The other huge difference is the te lithic technology we see in the area. So I've been a Southwestern archeologist all my life. And when I first came into this area and started walking across Virgin Branch sites, I said, wow, this technology looks different from anything I've seen with other farming communities, Pueblo and Ho'Kam, whatever. It's much more bifacial technology. What do I mean by that? Um, I'm gonna do this really quickly, but, but when you flint nap, you can either just knock a flake off and use it, and that's called expedient, or you can take a lot of time preparing it, and that's called a bifacial technology. Bifacial technology takes a lot more skill and a lot more work, and it actually makes an inferior product for the most part, right? If you take a piece of obsidian or volcanic glass, knock off a flake and try to cut through a hide, it's gonna be the sharpest before you do anything to it. Once you start retouching these edges, it's not as sharp. So this is the technology, this bifacial technology that you usually see with hunters and gatherers. Why? I'm gonna go, I'm going quickly because I don't have a lot of time, but let's see, I can't read my next one. Nope, I don't have it. People always use the, uh, um, Swiss Army knife analogy, right? A Swiss Army knife can do everything. If you're camping and you have a Swiss Army knife, you have a can opener, you have scissors, you have a hole punch and all, you have a knife, you have all of this in one. And it's very portable and you can carry it anywhere. On the one hand, it's not quite as good at any of those, right? If you're at home, do you use your scissors on your Swiss Army knife? Heck no, you go get a good pair of scissors, right? So this is the same idea that bifacial technology is good for mobile people because it's very portable and you can reuse it, but it, um, and you can carry it with you and you're not going to get caught out there without your knife or your scissors or your hole punch, right? Not scissors, they can have scissors, but they had hole punches and they had knives, right? So bifacial technology usually goes with hunters and gatherers. You usually don't get it once people settle down in one place, okay? Because then they can just throw a big old pile of rocks in the corner and whenever they need a knife, they can make a new one in two seconds, all right? I'm simplifying this, but, but trying to make it kind of quick. But in the Virgin Branch area, it still looks very bifacial, at least with Southwesterner to me. I suspect to Great Basin type people, it might not look quite as bifacial. In reality, they're kind of between the two extremes. But they maintain much more of that bifacial technology. So the way that they make things, they retain 
They also retained, remember I told you that the earliest farmers in the Moapa Valley kept that contracting stem of the gypsum point. See, there's a gypsum point. They keep it all the way through the Puebloan culture, okay? Everybody else has gone to side notched points, but they are keeping this contracting stem that can go all the way back to the Great Basin period and even, even older. So they've got a very different technology. That technology is not just a different way of flint mapping. It's a different way of hafting and using your points. So when you have a, a side notched point like this, you haft it by wrapping this twine against it, right? Um, when you have the contracting stem, you split the, uh, split the arrow, slide the stem in, and then keep it, put, put a bunch of, uh, of uh, asphalt or tar or something on there to get it to adhere. Right, So it's a very different way of doing things. And when they break, if it breaks, this one is, uh, you know, is, you're gonna have to untie it and redo it, but it's, it's, it, it's uh, easier to sharp. So it's a whole different technology set point. One's not better than the other. It's just very, very, very different. And this is what they were doing in the archaic period in the Great Basin. This is what their ancestors did. Um, oops, we already talked about the lithic technology, making it a lot faster. Uh, they tend to heat treat their lithics, which, which uh, most Puebloan sites are not doing. Something like um, virgin branch sites have anywhere between 20 to 40% of their lithics seem to be heat treated. At most other Puebloan sites, it's less than 2%. They were not heat treating them on most Puebloan sites. At the virgin branch Puebloan people kept heat treating. Okay, so what does this mean? Why did they do this? Let's get in this. Um, well, what I'm gonna argue, or what I have argued, is that the Virgin Branch people descended from these Great Basin ancestors. They adopted farming, they changed their identity so they would fit in with other Puebloan groups. But they didn't do everything. Things that didn't make sense to them, they didn't change. One of the things they kept was their lithic technology, the way they flint mapped, the way they made their arrowheads, and the type of animals they hunted. They kept hunting big game, even though they had to work harder for them, because we're in the middle of the desert, than people up on the Colorado Plateau would have. Now, McGuire and Hildeman have argued that in the Great Basin, there was the rise of what they call prestige hunting. They see a rise in big game, and they say it doesn't make sense caloric-wise. makes no sense. So they say, we think it was about prestige. We think it was the way that the men got their prestige by hunting big game. And that's what I'm going to say. They came from, a, came from a heritage that saw big game as something that brings you prestige. And they didn't want to change that. And big game, as we know, still brings men prestige, right? If you search on all these trophy hunters, they're always there with the big game. They're never sitting there with a rabbit head. Okay, people just don't mount their rabbit heads. It doesn't bring prestige. So they wanted to keep what gave them their sense of identity and sense of self. Okay, so in conclusion, the lowland virgin culture created a hybrid culture, I argue, that combined aspects of this great basin culture, their old, own ancestral heritage with the Puebloan culture. And I also wanna argue that they were not passive recipients of the Puebloan culture. They didn't just get this watered down thing, but they actively helped shape Puebloan culture and they actively chose what parts of it they wanted to adopt, what made sense to them and what made no sense. And if it made no sense to them, like changing their gender roles, like perhaps adopting a new religion that they didn't need, changing how they got their prestige and sense of self, they did not adopt those aspects of it. Okay, and with that, I am done and I will take any questions. Thanks. All right, so um, our first, can you hear me okay, Karen? Yes. I just wanna make sure. Our first question came in a little while back um, from Elaine. She wanted to know if they acquired corn from the Hohokam area, why didn't they identify with them? Well, the Hohokam are really far down there, okay? So the, uh, the Hohokam were, were, you know, there was that big gap between the Hohokam and the Moapa Valley. Um, now, <laughs> now the, the, the westernmost edge of the Colorado Plateau abuts Lake Mead, right? It, it's closer. So I think they wanted to be physically closer to, you know, they needed to be with people that were close enough to trade with and interact with and maybe even intermarry with. The whole con were down there. Now, we, the problem is 
I'm going to beat you to it, somebody to say, but what about the Colorado River, which comes all the way up? Probably there were farmers coming up there. We don't know for sure because the Colorado River has, has, has meandered so much it has destroyed pretty much all the archaeological sites on it. But we know once you come up to Hoover Dam, up from that area to the Moapa Valley, there's just not a lot of farmland. So they just had a big spatial gap between themselves and the whole Kong. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim asks, um, were there other far-flung descendants of the archaic Great Basin group similar to the Virgin Branch? Read that again, I'm sorry. Were there other far-flung descendants of the archaic Great Basin group similar to the Virgin Branch? Good question. We don't have, a lot. so the teeth study, all of this is coming from that teeth study. And they have a lot of um, teeth for, throughout the, uh, most of the Southwest. They don't have too much in the whole comp because they cremated their dead. So it's kind of where we have the databases. We do not have, to my knowledge, I don't know, if, and, and maybe I don't know if we have any bio arcs, I don't know if they don't exist or people haven't done the studies, but we do not have the teeth data for other areas. So there's no other teeth data that look like the Virgin Branch in the Southwest proper, in the area where the other Puebloan groups were, the Maguillon, the Holcom, there's nobody else there. Now, are there descendants to be found throughout uh, the Great Basin or maybe even the Fremont? Possibly, I don't know, but we don't really have that data. All right, and um, another question. This, uh, what happened to the lower virgin people? Oh my goodness, this, who asked that question? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say the name, did you hear that? <laughs> no, I did not hear the name. That's okay, that's a very good question. And the answer is we really, really don't know. Um, so what happens at around 1200 to 1250? So remember as archeologists, we just see the artifacts and we put a name to it. And we assume that name means something culturally. About 1200 to 1250, everything we recognize as Pueblo and disappears. No more of these Pueblo style houses are being built. Corn is no longer being grown. White pottery is no longer being made. It all, it's all gone. So most archeologists think the Virgin Branch Pueblo and area people left this area, that the area was depopulated. Perhaps we just kind of weakly say, cause we don't know, they moved in, they moved to the East. Uh, at that point when they left, everybody on the Colorado Plateau was kind of retracting East. And we think, and I kind of think that probably the Puebloan people also went and retracted East. There was no reason they had to up on the Colorado Plateau, there was a drought and it made sense that they had to leave. It made no sense for them to have to leave in the Wapa Valley. They should have been able to keep farming some years we know. Um, so that's one possibility that we retracted East. If they did that though, they left their material culture behind. They do not have very many signatures of anything virgin branch. It just goes away. Now, other people like Heidi Roberts, and I have heard the Paiute themselves think that the, and, and, and it's not impossible whatsoever, um, that the virgin branch people stayed here. They just stopped farming and they changed their lifestyle. Once again, they renegotiated that identity in a sense, and they stopped making the black on white pottery and they just shifted their lifestyle to uh, more of a hunting and gathering. And that's possible too. Um, I wouldn't want to have to bet my life savings on, on any answer. The bottom line is we just don't know. We just don't know. Whatever they did, they didn't leave us very many clues to figure it out. So. I have another question. Do you think that the corn farmers of that time wanted to talk to each other about farming? Absolutely, absolutely, I'm sure they did. So, you know, think about if you suddenly, I don't know, if you got married and moved to Pakistan and, well, actually I'll use my own example. I, went, I spent a summer in Costa Rica. <laughs> it was really fun. I would go into these fruit markets and I remember picking up things and, and thinking, I literally don't know if this is like a fruit that I'm supposed to peel and eat fresh, or if it's a vegetable that I'm supposed to cook like a vegetable. I was just literally saying, I have no idea what I'm holding, you know? So when you, when you enter something that's so foreign to you, you absolutely are gonna to talk to each other about the best way to, to farm, the best way to get the best crop, the best recipes. So I suspect they were always talking to one another and, and even up and down, I suspect prehistorically, uh, they probably had a lot more contact with each other than we give anybody credit for. So. Okay, and I did notice um, for everybody that the chat for some reason didn't come up in this webinar. 
Um, so Steve wanted to say um, thank you for a very informative presentation. Okay. And um, does anybody else have any questions or comments at this time? And I know that, well, give them a minute. I know we have a lot of um, volunteer site stewards that go out to the Moapa area and monitor archeological sites and have come across some of the artifacts that you've talked about in your presentation. Um, and for those of you who haven't been out to that area, um, you can also go to the Lost City Museum and see some of um, the artifacts that were um, housed from Lake Mead being inundated, you know, those sites. So uh, we do have a lot of really great resources out there for you to see this in person, even if you can't, you know, take your four by four out there and, and hike around uh, for a whole day um, or a couple of days. So let's see, I think I got another, right, I got another thank you and um, very interesting and I learned a lot. And I know I learned a lot myself. Um, I haven't taken one of your courses, Karen, <laughs> and I went to UNLV, <laughs> and I've heard a lot of the theories as well about, you know, it got too hot, too dry, let's go back to what we were doing before um, that was working for us, and, and I think um, studies like this are also relevant to our current times and with climate change and, and identity and, and adapting and changing and migration and, and all of that. Um, so if anybody tells you that this stuff isn't relevant, um, I beg to differ. So exactly. Thank you. Exactly. And I'll give a shout out to the site steward program. So we have done some excavations on some of these sites that have been exposed as the, the lake drops. And one year we, on our excavation, some site stewards came by and said, what are you doing? <laughs> so I thought that was fantastic. I thought it was wonderful. I knew that if, if we, you know, luckily we had our permit, we had shown them the permit, told them who we were, but it's nice to know that had we been somebody nefarious, they would have uh, would have been all over that. So. Oh, yeah. They're out. They're looking. They're watching. So, all right, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, this uh, video recording should be up before the end of next week. So just visit our website um, to get that link or email myself or Samantha. And thank you all for attending. And again, thank you very much, Karen. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Bye.